I think conversations are important. Arguably the most important part of communication and learning, and in a country with so many unanswered questions, conversation is surely a way to move forward. I want to ask questions about our past, present, and ways to move forward from people who should have more qualified answers than most. This is a journey. Questions are my vehicle, answers the destination. Remember, we live in the world our questions create. Chief Olushego Obasanjo is simultaneously one of the most important and divisive figures in Nigerian history. A former military and democratic leader, his mark on Nigerian history is indelible. While opinions may differ on his legacy, his commitment to his watch is unquestionable. Today, we speak to him about his recent book and ask a few questions about his life and opinions, beginning with his early life and time in the military, then political and public affairs, and finally, his thoughts on Nigeria in the now and the future then. My name is Shewa Debaju. Welcome to The Talk. Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome the former president, Chief Olusegun Obasanjo, to the show. He was president of Nigeria from 1999 to 2007. He served as a military ruler of this country from 13th of February 1976 to 1st of October 1979. I think when discussing Nigerian affairs, there's nobody more qualified to talk about Nigerian affairs as a former president, as now as a concerned Nigerian watching matters of state. And I'm honored to have the privilege to ask questions and get his informed opinion on behalf of a lot of Nigerians that I hope will watch this program. Um, recently, I picked up his books. I think the books were released in 2014. Um, the name of the book is My Watch, and it was divided into three segments. The first segment being early life and military, the second being political and public affairs, and the third being now and then. And I thought it was a great way to break down his life, a very illustrious career in two segments, identifiable segments, so you could address issues that came up in each and every one of them. And that is going to inspire a lot of this interview. Um, the first segment of the interview is going to be about the early life and military. The second segment will be about his political affairs and public affairs. And the third segment will be about the now and then. With that, I would like to welcome you to the program officially, sir, and thank you for the privilege. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, the delight of any author is to know that uh, his book is being read. And I'm delighted that uh, you have been reading my watch. Um, when we came in, we saw a lot of I.O. boards upstairs, and I was told that you are an I.O. champion. So we asked for the opportunity to play. I, I'm sure I'm going to lose, but I'm, I would love to attempt to go for it. So, And then I think for a lot of this generation, they don't know about these games. I was lucky enough to have a dad who just enjoyed beating his children. At and now you're game. He just enjoyed beating us. Good so. man. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a board here and we're going to start a game and I guess I'll ask you a couple of questions over the game. Yeah, that's all right. Well, uh, uh, as you know, um, Ayo is a popular game uh, among uh, on the, the Yorubas. I found that it's not only among the Yorubas. I was in a uh, late uh, Gilos Yorubas uh, village in Tanzania once and um, I saw Ayo under the Baba tree they are, uh, they are playing and I joined them in playing. But the rules are the same? The same, the, same, the, 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 the same way that we play it and uh, the same rule, the same uh, uh, system. So sir, do you want to go first? Or? Well, if you want, um, uh, since uh, you told me your father used to beat you, um, there's no reason why I shouldn't <laughs> beat you. Um, um, okay. Um, I think I'll start with this. The way you hold, you handle the the game, it doesn't show that. Um, <laughs> you are. Um, so, so the first question I have for you today <laughs> is um, in regards to your book. <laughs> what inspired the book? What was it like writing it? I think one thing that struck me was that the early details of your life. How can you remember those things so vividly? Well, what inspired the book? Um, let me first answer that. Um, uh, well, but before I answer that, let me chop the first one. <laughs> you are in this you game. But, but I, I, as I was saying, um, Really, the, the point is that I had written a few books before. I've written 
about my exploits in the civil war, which I call my command. I've written about my period as a military uh, head of state, which I call Not My Will. I've also written uh, some other books I wrote about uh, something about the led the first coup, who was a good friend of mine, Chukuma Nzeogo. And then people started asking me to write after my period in government as, uh, as um, a democratically elected uh, president. So I then, initially I didn't pay attention uh, to the request and the pressure. Um, then later on, I started thinking about it and I then said, look, since I've written a, a, a bit about, uh, what people wanted me to do was to write about my period in government as an elected, democratically elected uh, uh, president. Um, well, then that will mean something. Then there was the other side, another group was saying, look, do something about your con your life. Uh, or if you can't write about your life, authorize some people to write about your life. So I was in a dilemma. Dilemma because if I say I will write about my period in government, uh, that will still leave a gap. Mm. If I say I will write about my entire life, an autobiography, then what do I do with what I have written before? Do I repeat a uh, substantial part of my life was fighting the civil war? I've written a book on that. Important part of my life is my period in, in government as military uh, head of state. I've written on that and all that. So I then settled for, okay, I will do an autobiography. Um, then where it, as it concerns periods on, on which uh, I've written or on which I've written before, I will either make reference to them in the book that I've written uh, uh, on that period or uh, take just in uh, what I would call the meat of uh, that period. Uh, and that's uh, exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. So um, I had to write uh, an, aut an autobiography, which, of course, cr cr chronicled my early life, which hadn't been cr chronicled by me before. Now, uh, a few people who have written something about me, but uh, not authorized, so they made their research mm -hmm. and all that. <clears throat> so I then said, all right, the period that I haven't written before, which is my period as democratic, uh, democratically elected uh, uh, leader, that can take a, a substantial place. And then looking forward, what is but what do I see from now and a little bit looking into the future? Mm. So that's why you call now and then. Now and then. Uh, so the book, as you rightly pointed out, is divided into three parts. My early life and my, a little bit about my military career. Uh, then my period uh, public uh, service as democratically elected president and then from now on, what do I see? What are the lessons that we can draw? Mm. And how do, you, how do we look for? That's a very great answer. Um, while you were talking, I took the opportunity to look for something to chop. Yeah, well, let's see what you are doing. Mm. You make it. I made it too. So oh, you did. You did. So I have three. Oh, well, don't worry. <laughs>
Oh, mm. 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 Is a tough one. Yes, yes. You are making home. <laughs> mm -hmm. So my next question, um, mm. what are your feelings towards your place of birth? I mean, after everything that you've gone through and what you've done and you've achieved, you decided to come back here and see... Uh, uh, wow, I lost one. Thank you. You decided mm. to come back here for your retirement, so to say. Mm. Um, what, what was your reason for that? Well, I like this thing that the, they say, east or west, home is the best. Um, and for me, there's nowhere like home, really. Mm. And um, so, and of course, this is my route. Uh, whatever you might have done elsewhere in life, I think you shouldn't forget your route. Uh, I haven't forgotten mine. Uh, and I, I believe that really for any human being, taking, remembering his route is part of what uh, we must not take in lightly. Mm. So, um, the next question I have for you, I think um, my parents' generation, they're always talking about the good old days, Nigeria being this and that, mm. when they were younger and all. Do you really think those were the good old days? Were things better back then as opposed to now? Of course, things were better in those days than as opposed to now. Mm. Well, things were better than in those days than uh, right now. Uh, <laughs> you are playing double, my dear. Oh, I play double. You, know, you wait. <laughs> play game. Okay. Um, uh -huh. Play game. Uh -huh. Let's pack this one. Uh -uh, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think I forgot the original. Uh, you don't, of this you don't pack that one. Mm -hmm. no. Oh. Yes. It's a tough game. Well, no, what? No, no, no. What you should do? Take this one. You will eat this too. <laughs> I'm being schooled in the game here. Yes. That's also part of what you have won. I'm losing uh, pieces. Mm. So, in your time, I think nowadays we mm. see the women of the role of women in society is changing compared to your time back then. Do you think women? should have a more active role in politics. Do you think there should be legislation towards this in the form of a quota, or do you think it's something that should come naturally? I believe that um, there are some women, they don't want this, uh, there are two things they don't want. They don't want tokenism, and they don't want the condescension, so to say, of, uh, okay, we leave it to him, or we give him this, or we give her this because she's a woman. Uh, and I agree with uh, with uh, women who feel that way, but I believe what should be done is we leave it as voluntary. We leave a, a, a space for women, but we make it voluntary and say, look, here there's positive discrimination in favor of women, but any woman who doesn't want it can go for the uh, mm -hmm. complete and true competition, whichever way that competition goes. But there is need for us to have more women. Um, your childhood, do you have any fond memories from childhood or growing up in Abel Kupan? Oh yes, they, they, they have a lot of them. If you remember what you read about uh, um, uh, my watch, uh, I was born in a village, in uh, a village uh, in what they call Abeokuta province then. Um, so I remember, I have fond memories of uh, the village life, the moonlight uh, stories, uh, going to farm with my uh, father, and um, uh, going to market uh, with my mother. And uh, going to the river to draw water, uh, even before I went to school in the morning when I started school. And then 
on the days that we uh, did not go to school, going to the farm with my my father. I think those are fond memories, and then the way we played uh, among the children in, in the village, and the what I would call the uh, freedom and the uh, the unity within the village. I, I grew up in a small village where we have other tribes. Um, we have the uh, Kana people, we have uh, those are the Ibira, we have uh, Ibo, uh, we have Egon, uh, then we have Muslims and Christians. And we children grew up without any distinction as to uh, where we came from, tribe, the language, yes. the tribe, or even religion. And those were very happy memories. Very happy memories. Mm. Um, so, sir, we're moving on to your time in the military. Um, I I was actually I was actually going to ask um what pushed you towards the military first of all. Mm. Um, but before I ask that, I just wanted to say that reading the book, I discovered something I didn't know before was that you were orphaned at a very young age. I was. And I think I respect what you've achieved more because of that, because he is a self-made man, someone who achieved his dreams on his own through the military, through politics, through the will to make Nigeria better. So I just wanted to put that out there and then head on to what pushed you towards the military. Well, um, in those days, the time I joined the army in the mid 1950s, the military was not a popular choice for young people. He wanted, he wanted to go abroad and become an engineer, a lawyer, or uh, a doctor. Those are the three that um, he would say, oh, my, my son has gone abroad. Uh, mm. What is he coming, uh, coming up as? Coming up as a lawyer, or coming up as an engineer, or is coming up as a doctor? Um, there was the story of a man who, whose mother sent abroad and came back. He read economics. And when he came back, um, for a while he was staying with his mother. And, uh, and then one day he, came, he went to the market with, uh, to see his mother. And the mother's, and the mother's uh, uh, colleagues So uh, are you, uh, you came back about three months ago, what, what, what are you, what did you read? Uh, well, economics hasn't got a way you can put it in Yoruba. <laughs> so he said he read uh, buying and selling. <clears throat> so that's the way uh, katakara, or karakata, yes, buying ma'am. and selling. And then the mother, the uh, mother, uh, uh, the colleague said, he shouted, he said, what? You have gone to bomb money. Now, <laughs> the work that your mother and I are doing here, that's what you have gone to uh, <laughs> London to go and study. That's a waste of money. We will have taught you <laughs> better about buying and selling here. Um, uh, I, I tell that uh, to underpin, uh, you know, this idea that, uh, okay, if you go uh, abroad to study, uh, can only be, uh, or it should be engineering, mm. medicine, or uh, become a lawyer. So, <clears throat> because you have made reference to it that, I was not uh, opportune to be born with silver spoon in my mouth, uh, but uh, I was, uh, as they say in Yoruba, atapata day, somebody who really grew up on a rock. Mm. Um, uh, so I was looking for opportunities, I was reading, and then one day uh, I took the Daily Times, that uh, in those days Daily Times was uh, a popular uh, <laughs> newspaper, and there was this advertisement 
about going to uh, join to become an officer cadet. But the first thing is that you have to go for an exam. I so, said, well, since I was reading, let me go and try my luck. I went from the but I was I was in the USC in the but I left. I went to uh, from no I've left USC. I was teaching in a, a modern school, so I left and I, I went to take the exam. I passed. Then I was invited again for uh, interview. I went for the interview. I passed and they said, well, "Let me go and, and see what it is." Meanwhile, I've got. Uh, a UN scholarship for non-self-governing territories, students from non-self-governing territories. So I said, well, look, before I make use of this uh, um, scholarship, the, the uh, uh, what do you call it, the, um, the scholarship, sorry. Before I make use of this scholarship, let me see uh, if I can do something else. So, uh, and something else I thought I could do was that. Uh, and when I passed, I, I went to, in those days you go to Ghana. We go, we will, we will go to Ghana for six months. Oh. So I went to Ghana for six months. And after six months, there will be interview. You will either pass or you do not pass. Uh, I passed, so I had to go for further training in UK, and that's how I, I became. I, I would say, probably you would say I, I became an an uh, uh, an officer in the military by accident rather than by design. Mm. Mm. Um, how did the military shape who you are? Oh, the shape the military shaped me up when he, in, 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 in more ways than one. Uh, when we, we, we got to uh, to Accra in Teshi, we had a, a sergeant major, a British sergeant major called Cameron. Um, sergeant major Cameron, she got the first day there. And he looked at all of us, look at what Nigeria has sent. They are all not fit to be my servants. Uh, of course, we didn't know. Uh, I didn't know that the aim was to break uh, to break us and then remold us. That is the aim. So to to to, to make us lose confidence in ourselves and all that. Uh, but um, but we, and he, he he succeeded oh. because three Nigerians who were with us. Went back within the first week. Oh. Uh, hold on, they, they didn't expect this uh, type of treatment. And, oh, wait, well, I stick to, uh, uh, I, I stuck to it. I stuck to it because nobody asked me to go into it. I, I chose on my own to go into it. So let me see, um, see it through. And I saw it through. After 22 weeks, we had an interview. And uh, I passed, and then we had to stay for two extra weeks um, to complete the 24 weeks. And then we returned to Nigeria and prepared for going abroad to oh. the UK. Oh. I, would, I would say that I noted that the first time I came here, I noted that even till now I can see that military training in you. I came I, I came here once at 8.30 and 8.30 you're already up and about moving, doing your things. So I think the military still shows till now for their time in the military. I also think nowadays, um, youths today, they don't really see the military as a viable option, so to say. I think, but you pointed out that it was something that was happening even in your time. But nowadays, I think most youths want to be engineers, they want to be lawyers, they want to have a white collar job. Do you think there's a reason for that? Do you think the military is an option that people should consider? You can rise to the top of your profession. Um, when I joined the military, I did not know that I would. I didn't even know what ranks were there in the military, let alone uh, <laughs> what ranks I will rise to. And um, I, I did something else which some of my colleagues then thought it was a mistake. I opted for the 
the Corps of Engineers. Uh, and the highest rank in the Corps of Engineers in the Nigerian Army at the time I opted for the Corps of Engineers was a major. So some of my colleagues said, look, you must be a fool. The highest you will be able to rise in, in that Corps you have gone to will be the rank of a major. But um, as things uh, uh, happened, I, I, I rose to the rank of uh, the full general, uh, a four-star general. So um, I, I believe that any it, it, what what matters is your interest, uh, and um, and when you are in it with your interest, and, uh, and to be, do your best so that at every stage you are trying to excel, and uh, and, and that's what matters. That's very important. Um, I think um, while we're talking about the military, I want to skip ahead a little bit. I think um, I moved to Nigeria in 2002, 2003, and I think at that time, Nigeria was relatively peaceful. I really don't remember any security issues at the time. You were president at the time as well. So I think nowadays, um, whether it's by the advent of us having more access to media, social media and everything, it seems like there's more discussion of insurgency, this, or maybe that's just the world at large. Do you think the issues that we're having now, Boko Haram, headsmen, do you think if you are in office, would you handle them differently? What do you think about these things going on now? Well, you have to look at what is the origin of these things. And uh, when you look at the origin, you have allowed them to develop the way they have developed. Um, in 2011, I went to... Uh, Maduguri. This was after Boko Haram has attacked the UN building in Abuja. And I, I just wanted to know, look, what is, who are these? Boko Haram, do they have leaders? Do they have objectives? What are their objectives? What are their grievances? Where do they want to go and why? And then met the president at that time and I told him and his reaction to me was very good. He said, look, I trust your judgment. Uh, you can go. Uh, and if you want to use uh, government uh, aircraft, uh, we will give you. I said, no, don't give me government aircraft because once I am seen in government aircraft, I become a government agent and this is a, uh, uh, um, an effort of mine to find out the truth, fact finding. Okay. Now, let me go about it, uh, and I and I did, and um, I found that these elements of Boko Haram had been there even when I was in government, and they through their uh, intermediary. They said to me that, look, they were there, but I, I didn't disturb them, so they didn't disturb me. They were preaching Sharia, uh, and uh, so and that's what they, 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 they were still doing. Um, so what then happened? When I left government, according to them, they were being chased, they were being hunted, uh, they were being hunted. Uh, and um, they lost a number of their, uh, their adherents mm -hmm. and, and, and they decided to fight back. Even the leader of their sect, uh, Muhammad Yusuf, was killed. The in-law of Muhammad Yusuf uh, was killed. And they went to court to try and get uh, compensation, which was uh, granted to them, but which the state government did not pay. So, uh, and the question you have asked, will I have handled uh, matters uh, differently? Of course, uh, from what I know now, I will have handled matters differently. And uh, the point really also is that when you look at Boko Haram and you look at the, where they are thriving, um, in the northeast, and you compare the 
educational level in other parts of the country, particularly in the southern part of the country, with the situation in the uh, northeast, uh, northeast also. I, I can tell you what I found out. In the southeast, south south, the level of education was ninety five percent. In southwest, it was ninety four point five percent. In northeast, where uh, Boko Haram is thriving, uh, it was fifty three point. Five percent, mm. and for uh, women, it was even much less. Now, one doesn't need an oracle to tell you that that disparity is a cause, a mm. source of problem. Definitely, education can be okay. Used okay, and so if you then want to deal with the issue, there will be the long term and the short term or even maybe short term, medium term, and long term. Now, <clears throat> education is a long term thing because you don't get the result of your education and in five years, minimum 10, 12, 15 years because you will spend six years in primary school, maybe four, yeah. five, uh, five in secondary school, that's 11, maybe four or five in tertiary school, uh, uh, institution. Okay. So you are talking of 16 years before your product becomes an instrument that you can use. But you have to begin, because if you don't begin, you don't get there. And of course, every youth that you deny education to is not going to be able to serve himself as he should have served himself. He will not be able to serve his family as he should have served his family and surely not his community and his country. So the second aspect of that is okay. The, intran the, the intransigent ones, you have to use stick to deal with them. Mm -hmm. So I have always been talking of stick and carrot, deal with the issue of Boko Haram mm -hmm. and insurgency uh, in any part of our country. Um, I have told on this, your... Uh, I mean, I'm going, to, I'm going to make my next move here. I okay, don't see uh, any uh, other viable okay. move. Well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm following you. <laughs> so so um, we're going to hurry up because time. And we're moving on to segment two, political and public affairs.